I have bad news. So the first couple questions I received are kind of open-ended. They were both uh, some variation of doom, some examples with quadratic word problems. So, sure, I can do that. If I now have everybody's attention, we can look at some of the stuff from the homework, which is all graded, by the way. I'm not sure I'll have a chance to get it back to you today, but a or an example that has shown up in a few places by now is house sparrow population versus human disturbance. And the exact units of human disturbance aren't super critical, but human disturbance is a measurement of, well, pretty much what it says, how much human traffic and how much human activity is going on in the area. And as with basically every quadratic or polynomial that wasn't hand grown in a lab to look nice, um, the relationship between the population and the human disturbance is not a lovely one. It's got all these ugly decimals in it. But here, why is the population and the human disturbance is X. And we'll ask a few questions about this relationship. So question one, what levels of human disturbance will lead to extinction or Extinction in the area, I should say. House sparrows are by no means an endangered species. But what level of human disturbance will result in there not being any house sparrows in some neighborhood or area? Well, I've said this before, and I think um, a lot of the time when students struggle on this material, it's the very first step, the setting things up step. Because to answer this question, we have to recognize that we're being asked when the sparrow population will be equal to zero. We have to make that leap 
that a population has been driven to extinction or driven out of an area when there are no animal pop animals left in the population, or when there are no animals in the area. So we have to be able to recognize that we're interested in when y is equal to zero. And if we can make that leap where, I won't say we're golden, but at least we're well on our way, because we do know how to solve equations of the form zero equals negative zero point four seven one x squared plus fifty. 15.278x minus 21.338. Act in one sense. Solving these equations is very straightforward. We take A, we take B, we take C, we plug them into the quadratic form. I can't say, though, that students always find this to be the easiest thing to do, just because the quadratic form has so many places where you can make some little mistake and then get a completely wrong answer. If you forget a negative sign in front of the B, for example, or a lot of the homework I got Students would correctly write down the negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus four a c. Students would correctly write this down, correctly write the two a down and then just give me the wrong numbers. And I mean, theory at some point between writing it down on the paper and plugging it question. The negative 221.338, does that go in as positive down there? Ah, no. Okay. I was just making sure because I was like, I got that. So, yes, yeah, speaking of making little errors and then not knowing what went wrong at the end of the problem, I'll get stuff that is correct and then I'll get wrong numbers. So, okay, something went wrong somewhere, but of course I can't see the buttons that that students put into their calculator. I generally, generally think it's easier to do this sort of step by step. So what I usually do, is find the square root first. Let's get this. Where'd my calculator go? And give this calculator a second to load, and then we'll proceed.
So as I was saying, I normally do the square root first. The square root of B squared minus four times A times C. Thirteen point nine hundred all divided by two A. Let's take this opportunity to do that two times negative 0 0.471, negative 0 0.942. And it's still not too late to not too late to mess things up, unfortunately. Remember that if you're typing addition or subtraction into a calculator and you have operations in the numerator or operations in the denominator, those are going to need to be inside parentheses. So, okay, I wish this calculator wouldn't fight to zoom quite so much. Negative fifteen point two seven eight plus thirteen point nine divided by negative point nine four two. Now, let's share this one point four six three. And again, our units are kind of what are our units? One point four six two pedestrians per hectare per minute. There is another solution. If remember plus or minus, so that other solution is thirty point nine seven four. So one point four six three. Thirty point nine seven four. Um, and I'm not an orthologist, is it? I'm not a bird scientist, but I guess it makes sense to me that we have two questions. I'm sorry. First of all, ornithologist. Uh, second of all, um. When it gets to exam time, you're going to specify whether or not you want us to use the quadratic equation or if we're allowed to use uh, a graphing calculator and just finding the roots of the polynomial. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I'll, I'll give my sort of general comment now, which is that 
if you use the quadratic formula though and something goes wrong, at least I can see that you are trying to use the quadratic formula. Whereas if you just used our calculator and something goes wrong, I'm going to have no idea where the number comes from and just mark it wrong without any sort of extra credit. So I guess, I mean, I don't really care which method you use in one sense, but in another sense, there are advantages to trying the quadratic form to work. Um, so back to this, um, I guess, I mean, I feel like this makes sense because how sparrows are evolved to live in urban environments. So if an environment is just completely deserted and there aren't any people in it, that's not good for them. If an environment is so crowded and noisy that they cannot roost or nest in peace, that's not good for them. So there are two sort of points of extinction here. One from there not being enough people, one from there being too many people. We can ask another question, unless anybody has questions about what's come so far. I think I know where I'm going wrong. Like I'm doing like the 15.278 yeah. um, square root and then doing using that number and then doing the whole thing instead of doing it all together. Right. So, so I think that's where I'm getting my right. answer. Everything wrong. under the square root does have to be under the square root. You can't find the square roots separately. If there are no questions about this, let's continue on with the example. We've looked at extinction. Let's ask kind of the opposite question. What level of human disturbance is best for the sparrow. And because best might have multiple answers, I'll make explicit. That I'm interested in when the sparrow population is at its maximum. So this quadratic. If we only look at it in its first quadrant, it looks like this. And there's extinction if there's too little human disturbance. And there's extinction if there's too much human disturbance. And then there's a level of human disturbance that maximizes the population. And this is the vertex of the parabola. So we are plugging and saying with the um, vertex formula. So negative 
B is 15.278 divided by two times A, negative zero, 0.471. And actually doing this is going to be quick piece of paper. Again, when people have problems, it's usually recognizing that this is the formula we want to use. So negative B divided by, again, the parentheses, Two times negative point four seven one sixteen point two one nine. Which makes sense. I mean. If this is too little and this is too much, then just right probably ought to be about midway between them, which is exactly what we do with five. The next question, I guess I really should say the other question I received, was less open-ended, so very concretely, say you're asked to find the root of a polynomial. So you do this on your calculator, or at least so far, we've worked entirely on our calculator. So you used your calculator, you get some kind of answer. How do you check? your work, which as a professor is always a nice question to get. I confess that when I'm standing up here, I normally just assume that everything I've done is correct unless someone raises their hand and says I made a mistake, but it's certainly always good to check your work if you can do so. And the answer to this lies in the fact that if you take a root and plug it into the polynomial, by the definition of what a root is, you ought to get zero back. So let's look at a concrete example. Just uh, summing up with the polynomial off the top of my head. P of x equals x cubed plus 3x squared minus 1. And let me copy that on to the physical whiteboard as well. Let's state our goal to find 
roots, any and all roots that there might be, with the added caveat that we should check our work when we are done. Well, as far as finding the roots, we'll go to y equals, we'll type that in. There are three roots, so this could get a little typical, a little tedious, but let's at least do this in full with one of the roots. Let's say this one, the one furthest to the left. We'll go count, zero. Got another question about what to do if the cursor is moving really slowly. I mean, you definitely see that sometimes, like here the cursor is moving fast, here the cursor is moving slow. Unfortunately, I don't have a great answer about what to do about it. I think you just have to be patient. So there's a left bound, there's a right bound, there's a root. Notice this is a theme that might return. Notice that we get a little rounding error here. This, remember this e to the negative 12 says take that decimal place and move it well of places to the left. So our calculator is claiming that y is 0 0.00000000001. Well, y is zero. That's just a tiny bit of rounding error that is um, we're getting for some reason. Ah. equals negative 2.879385. If this is a root, then when we plug it into that quadratic, we ought to get to zero. Um, notice, if we want to make our lives easier, after we do this help, this root finding, the value of x we got is stored in our calculator as x. So we can type x cubed plus 3 x squared minus one, we're supposed to get zero. Instead, as we already saw, there's that tiny bit of rounding error. But if we round to fewer than 12 decimal faces, we do get to zero. So this does seem to be a root. I mean, if you're not comfortable using your calculator, like if this, if you forget this feature that X is being stored in your calculator, you could also type this in manually. If you do this, you're probably going, I mean, you're definitely going to get some rounding error. 
but the trout x to four decimal faces. And let's try not to make any goofy errors like that. Negative 2.8794. Plus three times negative two point eight seven nine four squared minus one. This is supposed to be zero. We rounded that root, and that is demonstrated we're getting rounding error here that um y is negative 0 0.0001 so that happens and i mean there's no way around occasionally getting rounding error but if you're doing everything correctly and you plug your root into the polynomial, you should get something that's close to zero. I mean, you should get zero, but rounding error, as we have seen, will result maybe in us just getting something close to zero. And this, this varies from root to root. Sometimes there's rounding error, sometimes there isn't. Let's see if I can get a root without any rounding error. The next root we compute is negative 0 0.652784. That's stored in X. And if we enter X cubed plus three X squared minus one, we're supposed to get zero and we do get zero. No rounding error this time. Third root. Again, this time we don't see any rounding error. We get this value of x. We get our calculator says that y is zero. This value of x is stored in our calculator. If we take this x cubic minus three x squared minus one. What did I do wrong? Plus three x squared minus one. We do get zero, no rounding error. So that's, I mean, we're not doing anything really clever here, just uh, taking the root, plugging it into the polynomial. If it really is a root, we ought to get to zero. And as far as things I was asked for on Thursday's group work, I think that's it. But if anybody has any questions now that they didn't ask Thursday, I'll certainly take them. Yes. Um. How do like on these on these ones right here? Which which do you put in for like h? Like, would you put like three meters in? Or yeah, this was. I don't quite. Like for the um these word problems, do you use like the three meters or do you use like the seconds? Or does mm. it depend on what it's asking you? 
No, no. I mean, here we're asked when the object hits the ground. The object will hit the ground when its height is zero. Oh, okay. So we're just setting this equal to zero using the quadratic form of the... Okay. So next, we won't, we won't finish this, but we will start polynomial, um, in particular, synthetic. Polynomial division. Why we want to do this, we'll wait until some later day in this week. For now, this is just a process that we are going to present. And it's based on whole numbers. Say that you have a whole number and another whole number that evenly divides into it. Then, because five evenly divides into 10, the result of this division is a whole number. If we take this equality and multiply both sides by five, then we can write 10 as the product of two whole numbers. And if we've seen factoring polynomials before, we can think of this, or even if we have it for that matter, we have factored 10, maybe not complete, although in this case we have done it completely, two and five are both prime, but we've written 10 as the product of two smaller numbers. And we're interested in doing something like this for polynomials. We'd like to take a polynomial and divide it by another polynomial. And the only division that we are going to be interested in for this class is, don't want to use R, let's use S. In this class, we're only going to be interested in cases where one polynomial divides into another polynomial evenly. Yeah. So we're not going to have any remainder terms floating around. If you remember remainders from elementary school, we're going to take one polynomial, divide it into another, get a third polynomial, and that then allows us to multiply both sides of that equality by q of x, and get that equality, that factorization of P of X. We can do this in general. We can divide one polynomial by another, 
even if it doesn't divide evenly. But we're going to be interested exclusively in one kind of special case where the where the polynomial down here, the divisor, is this very simple first degree polynomial. If we have a division, a polynomial division that looks exactly like this, we can do this division quickly and easily or maybe I shouldn't say easily, but we can do this division using a special process called synthetic division. Trying to discuss synthetic division kind of in generality would be a real headache and probably not super clear. So let's give a concrete example. Let's take x cubed plus x squared minus 5x plus 3. And let's illustrate synthetic division via example by dividing x minus one into that polynomial. We're going to start by taking that number down there, in this case one, and we're going to write it, and then we're going to write a vertical bar next to it. A lengthy vertical bar. I'm giving myself room to write on two different rows here. Then a horizontal bar and on this row up here, I'm going to write to the coefficients of these polynomials. So that's one x cubed, one x squared, negative five x, positive three. And now I am going to sort of fill this in. I'm going to have, by the time I'm done, I'm going to have a list of numbers down here. And that's my goal. So the first thing we do, is a dropping down step. Whatever number we have written first, we're going to pull it down and place it under the bar. And we're now going to have a series of multiplication and addition steps. The multiplication we're going to do, because both my numbers are one, it's not totally obvious, but 
we're going to take this number down here and this number to the left of the bar, and we're going to multiply them. And we are then going to write the result of that product to there. Um, and now addition. These numbers that we have directly vertically aligned with each other, we're going to add. And then we're going to just keep repeating the steps. Multiplication, one times two is two. Addition, two plus negative five is negative three. Multiplication. One times negative three is negative three. Addition, negative three and positive three is zero. And the bar or the chart is now completely filled in and we've done the division. And it just becomes a matter of, can we interpret what we have done. And we make sense of that list of numbers. And the way this works is just like, just like this polynomial turned into that list of numbers in the front, in the uh, top row. So this list of numbers is going to turn into a polynomial. And the polynomial it's going to turn into is going to be one degree less than the degree we started with. And the coefficients are just going to be read from left to right. One X squared plus two X to the first minus three. Yeah. And that polynomial is our answer. It's the result of the division. Just like, just like 10 divided by five was two, this cubic polynomial divided by x minus one is x squared plus two x minus three. And you might be complaining, at least in your head. Now, what about this last term? What about this zero? This zero is the remainder term. If you can think, I know that probably most people, I mean, including me, have not done actual long division by hand since like fourth grade or whatever. But if one number does not divide perfectly into another, you get the remainder term. And that's what this zero is. All of the polynomials we are going to be looking at, all of the divisions, the polynomial in the bottom is going to divide perfectly into the polynomial in the top. And our remainder term should always be zero. If you ever get a different remainder, then something somewhere has gone wrong.
So how did you get the um, the square root of one x? Square root? You mean the um, one x? The, um, the um, squared. Uh, so I'm re so the result of this division is always going to be to reduce the power by one. So we started with a third degree polynomial. So I knew the result has to be a second degree polynomial. And that's it. I've got your stuff all graded, but we're out of time. Get to your homework back tomorrow. Doing fast work on this tomorrow. So we have not finished this material, but we'll do so tomorrow.